Thank you very much, Nathan. And thank you very much to the Heartland Institute for inviting me to uh, speak to you all today. And thank you for letting me interlope on your lunches. Uh, I, I decided not to use PowerPoint today on the grounds that people facing away from the screen would have to twist themselves in half, impeding their digestion, uh, which is a, a big thing in Quebec where I come from, so didn't want to do that. Um, yes, uh, as Nathan mentioned, over the past few years, I've been creating, producing, hosting a documentary series about education, and it's not 12 episodes, Originally, I was planning on six, but uh, my contact at PBS uh, discouraged me from trying for that because he didn't think anyone would carry it at that length uh, and negotiated me down to four, which is what we've ended up with. Uh, if all goes well, if I don't mess anything up between now and December, it should air uh, early next year. Um, I want to talk a bit about the subject matter of that documentary today, um, which overlaps very much with entrepreneurship in education. The question the documentary asks is fairly simple to express. Why does excellence scale up massively and routinely in every field except education? You know, if you invent a better way to brew coffee or uh, run a retailer on retail outlet online, invent a better cell phone, you scale up internationally. Within a few years, anyone in the world can have access to your products and services. But in education, great teachers are more like floating candles, beautifully illuminating their immediate vicinity, but never really, or seldom at least, touching off a wider blaze. Um, you know, the thing about this is, is that we don't lack great teachers. Many of us have had wonderful teachers in the course of our lives, and almost all of us will have heard stories of other great teachers through the media. For instance, some of you may recall the movie Stand and Deliver that came out in 1988, seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Uh, which dramatized the life of Jaime Escalante, a fantastic calculus teacher from East LA, public school teacher. At the height of the success of the Escalante math program, they had more students at their uh, East LA Barrio school passing advanced placement calculus than did Beverly Hills High. And this is the, the statistic that really blows my mind. In 1987, one quarter of all the Mexican American students nationwide who passed AP Calculus attended Garfield. One quarter of all of them nationwide who passed AP Cal Calculus were Garfield High students. It's, it's an amazing accomplishment. Well, what would happen to Jaime Escalante in any other field? Well, probably he'd start his own business or be snapped up by someone else's and would be drafting curricula and training teachers for entire states, the whole nation, internationally. Didn't happen. Within three years of the movie's release, Escalante had been demoted and pushed out of Garfield. So the problem is not that we lack great teachers, nor, as it turns out, is that we lack entrepreneurs interested in education who want to bring great instruction to large numbers of students. Consider the case of Reed Hastings. Before founding Netflix, Hastings joined the Peace Corps, and he taught mathematics in Swaziland. After returning to the US, he built a software company that he ultimately sold for $750 million. Nice accomplishment right there. And long before he brought us House of Cards, he was taking graduate courses in education because he wanted to know why that field seemed to be lagging the rest of the economy, why it wasn't scaling up excellence. Well, 
In just the last few years, Hastings has donated many millions of dollars to educational causes. But he's decided not to build an education business. And he told a reporter why that is. He said, I don't want people to think I'm doing it for the money. Well, I mean, you can see where he's coming from. Earning a profit from educating children is pretty much reviled in a lot of the world today. Uh, he would indeed be seen by many people as uh, a bad person for running an education business. So it's not too surprising that he's decided to stay out of it. But just imagine what would happen if doing business in every field were looked down upon so harshly as doing business in education is looked down upon. Actually, you don't bother imagining that because that's actually what was happening around the world up until the 1700s. Um, before that point in history, the only respectable people were priests and soldiers, people who were living off an inheritance. If you worked in any other field, you were beneath the notice of those dignified people. And if you ran a business, you were beneath their contempt. In other words, all that hostility that Hastings is worried about today, if he were to start an education business, was directed at entrepreneurs in every field. It was a pervasive part of the culture uh, well into the 1600s. In fact, you can find bits of it even in the works of Shakespeare. In The Winter's Tale, he has a character say, let there be no lying, because that only suits tradesmen. Now, coming from a guy who uh, made up stories for a living, I mean, it seems a bit harsh. Uh, fortunately, in the 16 and 1700s, that attitude started to change. And even Shakespeare himself is a transitional figure. Some of his other plays have business people depicted as nice and honorable, um, fine people, for instance, his comedy of errors. So why am I telling you all this? Well, what does it have to do with education? There's an interesting coincidence. Uh, just as attitudes towards entrepreneurship were changing, were becoming more favorable in the 1700s, something else happened, something else quite important. The Industrial Revolution. Interesting coincidence, except that according to the economist Deirdre McCloskey, it's not a coincidence at all. She argues that the change in public attitudes towards business were precisely what sparked the Industrial Revolution. Well, if that's true, her theory would explain why education has lagged the rest of the economy. People are still reviled for running for-profit education businesses today. And as Hastings is an example, that's a bit of a discouraging factor from getting involved. There may be plenty of other Hastings out there choosing not to build businesses in education despite the fact that they have a great personal interest in doing so. And without those entrepreneurial innovators, the scaling up of excellence grinds to a halt. But remember, this explanation hinges on McCloskey's theory for the Industrial Revolution. Is she right? It's very difficult to say for sure. Um, one thing is clear, though. Her theory meshes well with the evidence in education from all over the world. I'll give you a few examples. In Chile, uh, the public's, attitude toward, public's attitudes toward private schooling have varied a great deal over the past several decades, from positive or at least indifferent to extremely negative. And based on McCloskey's theory, we'd expect Chilean entrepreneurs to have reacted accordingly moving into and out of that line of work based on the public's attitudes. Did it follow that pattern? Well, let me explain. Um, 
give you a little bit of context, in the early 1980s, Chile adopted a nationwide private school choice program, basically a voucher program. And the government allots a certain amount of money for each child's education. Parents can use it at a public or a private school. When that happened, private schools enrolled a small minority of students. I think it was well below 20%. But by 2012, it had risen to 60%. A large majority of kids are now in the private sector in Chile. But attitudes since 2012 have been turning negative. Some of you may recall the Chilean student protests that uh, started up around 2011 and continued well into 2013. Uh, these are mostly college students protesting uh, demanding that college fees be abolished. Not surprising, thing for them to ask for. And those same protesters were criticizing Chile's private school system or system of private school choice. Well, to learn more about this system and, and what impact the protests were having on education business leaders, I, I went to Chile uh, with my documentary crew and interviewed, uh, interviewed a few people. One of them was Ernesto Tironi, who is an economist by training and the owner of a couple of schools. When the choice program was first introduced, he got together with several friends and they decided they wanted to help low-income kids by opening a chain of schools in slums of Santiago, of Valparaiso, other cities in Chile. So they started by buying out one school that was notoriously performing poorly in teaching reading. Uh, by the third grade, barely half of students were fluent in reading. So they bought this school and they hired specialists to come in and retrain their staff. Lo and behold, three years later, they were getting 80% of their students to proficiency in reading by the third grade. It's a really nice accomplishment. They were pleased by it and decided to buy another school and planned to open many more. In fact, pardon me, in fact, they had already chosen several locations to build new schools. And then the student protest came along and the leading candidate for the presidency during that election era was Michel Bachelet, a socialist who um, took up all of the things that the student protesters were asking for, and promised to rein in uh, this, the Ch Chile's private school choice program, and in particular promised to outlaw for-profit schools like Ernesto's. So I asked him about this and he said, well, the way people are talking now, it's considered a sin to make a profit educating children. In this environment, it would be silly to build a new school. Well, consequently, he and his uh, business colleagues decided that it would be unwise to open any new schools, and so they didn't. Unfortunately, their response is typical. Uh, I've talked to academics from Chile, and they describe the reaction of Tironi as typical. Other business leaders are also stopping, uh, no longer investing in opening new schools uh, in the country. And this is all very unfortunate because up until quite recently, Chile had been one of the fastest improving countries in the world on international tests, the PISA and the TIMS, if you follow these things. And it is also the highest performing country in Latin America on those tests. So possibly eliminating huge portions of the schools that have accomplished this improvement may not be a good thing. And Tironi and his colleagues were right to worry about it because earlier this year, Michel Bachelet, the president now, successfully uh, got legislation enacted to outlaw for-profit schools. Um, 
I'm not quite sure what will happen to the students who attend those schools. There are one million students in for-profit private schools at the elementary and secondary level in Chile. Not clear at all what will happen to them. So to sum up, while educational entrepreneurship was encouraged in Chile, it boomed and quality improved. Now that education entrepreneurs are shunned, they've stopped investing. That's exactly what we would expect based on Deirdre McCloskey's theory of formation of the Industrial Revolution. But how do we know if the Chilean example is at all representative? How do we know that it's not just some accident of circumstance? Well, one thing we can do is look at other countries, uh, particularly very different countries, that have similar education systems and see if they had the same effect. Well, about a decade after Chile adopted its national private school choice program, Sweden did the same thing. It went from having 1% of students in private schools to having 16%, 1-6% today. So still much lower uh, portion in private schools today than uh, is the case in Chile. But it attracted some quite innovative people into education or allowed innovators already in the education system to try out their ideas. Uh, a lovely woman that I interviewed in Sweden was Barbara Bergström. Barbara's actually an American by birth that emigrated to uh, Sweden in the 1970s, I believe it was, and she became a public school teacher and was worried when the pedagogical culture in Sweden started turning away from emphasizing academics and having the teacher be respected and um, really plan lessons and instead giving total control over the system to the students themselves, whatever they might uh, want to do with that control. So when this school choice program was introduced in Sweden, she founded a school called the International English School. And it was quite popular. She had a, a kind of back to basics mentality and, and mission and she required students and, and their parents to sign uh, a code of conduct for the students, saying that they would respect each other and the teachers, um, and uh, observe the school's dress code, that sort of thing. Very conventional uh, code of conduct. Well, it turns out that this is illegal, or at least borderline illegal, in Sweden. Uh, Sweden has laws that are meant to protect students from bad schools. And so any kind of code of conduct or rules have to be approved by the students themselves. Well, not in Barbara's world. <laughs> so uh, when one of her schools in the town of Uppsala was uh, ratted out as having a dress code that the students had not been consulted on, uh, she told the regulators, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's part of our school culture and we're not going to change it. So reporters found this interesting and they descended on the school and they interviewed the principal. He explained that it was a very basic, simple uh, dress code that they didn't allow uh, bra straps to be seen, they didn't allow exposed underwear from low-hanging pants, uh, you know, very basic things, and the, uh, the reporter pressed him, given the law in Sweden, uh, about having the students have a say in this, and he said, well, we think it's more important to have an atmosphere conducive to learning than to let kids show their underwear, so we're just going to keep it. <laughs> this blew up in the media and they had a flood of applications to their schools all around the country because between the early 90s and today, IES went from one school to a network of about 20 schools enrolling more than 20,000 kids. And they're not just one of the largest chains in Sweden, they're also one of the fastest growing, and they still can't keep up with demand. 
there are 30,000 kids on their waiting list. And they're adding three or four schools a year, more every year, uh, but it's hard for them to keep up with the demand because they're offering something very different. And it's not that all private schools have adopted this, this approach. There's another chain called Knowledge Schools that tries to provide that loose uh, student-directed experience or student-centered experience that Swedes had been trying to provide in, in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, but to do so more thoughtfully. So in knowledge schools, every student meets for 15 minutes uh, every week one-on-one -on -one with an advisor. And the advisor goes over uh, their homework from the previous week that they had said they were planning on doing and discusses with the student what the student should be doing in the next week. So there's, there's an adult at the school, a teacher, who is in contact with every single student, knows exactly what they should be doing, what they are doing, and this manages them, this uh, allows them to be quite successful. Um, So, I'd like to actually skip ahead to talk about Korea, which has an, another interesting variation on this idea of respecting entrepreneurship in education. Korea has a fairly conventional uh, public school system, um, elementary and secondary, but there is a huge demand in Korea for after-school tutoring, an enormous demand. Uh, we know it in, in the US as cram schools, or you know, the, in Korea as cram schools. And these are so common, so popular, partly because there are very high stakes entrance exams to university in Korea. In fact, the government administers this exam. The better you do on it, the wider range of universities you have access to. And in Korea, the job market is still very much bent on which university did you attend? Not how well did you do, but just which one did you get into? Because they think of that as a marker for the hardest working kids, the, the ones that achieved the most. Well, this results, as I say, in a, in a great interest in tutoring. And as a student I interviewed uh, told me, she said, it's a market. It's a real market. The tutors compete with one another to attract students, and the students and, and parents want the best tutors they can find. Well, what happens in this environment is that the best tutors become celebrities, not just you know, well-regarded, they're celebrities. Uh, another student I, I interviewed actually said that having grown up in Daejeong, uh, a, a city to the south of Seoul, when she moved to Seoul, she was in the subway station with some friends, and they saw one of the tutors whose lessons they'd been following online and ran up, as you would to a Hollywood star at that age, and, and wanted an autograph, uh, the, the whole nine yards. Well, there's another nice thing for the tutors about this arrangement. The tutoring firms are a, a true marketplace in that they have very few regulations on you know, what salaries they can give and what structures. Uh, negotiating with their employees is entirely up to them. What's evolved is that because tutors could easily move from one chain to another, be a, you know, delivering lessons via the web. They don't have to relocate in the country. In order to keep the best teachers, the tutoring firms have to have profit sharing systems. So one tutor I interviewed earns about 22, 23% of the total revenue his lessons bring in, right off the top. Which is quite nice because over the last 10 years, his total revenue was $100 million. So he made over $20 million teaching. And he's one of the celebrities, not surprisingly, because his, 
his class size in a given year is somewhere in the 100, 150,000 range. Uh, he reaches a few thousand students directly, gives in-person lectures, and in addition to that, those lectures are filmed and broadcast via the web, so students from all over the country can follow them, and if you're the best, or at least you have very good word of mouth, you get a lot of students, and the fees are fairly low, they're quite affordable, but they nevertheless amount to a large chunk of change when you have hundreds of thousands of students taking your lessons each year. So this is uh, quite an excellent system in that it has indeed attracted a lot of good entrepreneurially minded educators into the field. And students in public opinion surveys say that they much prefer the instruction they receive in the tutoring system to the regular school system. There are a number of reasons for that, but uh, one of the tutors pointed out that school, the regular school, is somewhere you have to go, you know, an assigned school, for instance. But a hagwon, which is the, the tu what the tutoring schools are called, a hagwon is chosen. Students want to be there. And so what actually happens is that students often nap during the regular school day at their desks. Sometimes they just put their heads down and pull up a blanket. While at night, 10 o'clock at night, 11, 12 o'clock, they study assiduously and are bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And that's because they find the lessons more satisfying, more effective. This system of combining a long regular school day with tutoring into the late into the night doesn't seem ideal, but you can certainly see that the system that delivers the tutoring is producing a very high caliber of performance and attracting really top-notch people uh, who might not stay in the teaching profession, teaching profession if salaries are not commensurate to the work effort they're putting in. Um, so what can we do about this from a policy standpoint? The Chilean and Swedish systems have basically a, a voucher program uh, and that allows all families to afford education in the private sector, allows them to access these entrepreneurial schools, which is marvelous. And it creates a market for the entrepreneurs themselves so that they can actually uh, earn a good living if they are successful, if they're, if they're popular. But there is a downside to the Chilean and Swedish model. It's that all of the funds are coming from the government. And so legislators feel that somebody needs to watch out for how that money is used and they don't necessarily trust the parents, and so over time, regulations tend to accrue. And as in Chile, for-profit schools are now outlawed entirely. Um, this is a, a real problem for entrepreneurship, obviously. Uh, in Sweden, the situation has been uh, more bizarre. Uh, in addition to the dress code imbroglio that IES ran into, up until I think about the late 1990s, it was illegal to test students in elementary school, particularly if you tested them more than once a year. That was considered to be a real drag on students' freedom and to cause them to be overstressed and also pretty difficult to figure out how well they're doing if you don't test them or to apprise them of how well they're doing. And so it has had a negative effect on the performance of, of Swedish students on international tests. Um, but these regulations come and go and they're quite flighty. There is a regulation passed, uh, I believe in 2011, that said all the students at both public and private schools must have attended one of Sweden's teachers' colleges well, that's not necessarily a great idea. I mean, you can see that the goal is good. They want well-qualified teachers. The problem is that 
the students enrolled in the country's teacher training programs were at the time the lowest aptitude students in any, uh, in any discipline. Uh, in fact, the, the test, there's a Swedish scholastic aptitude test and it's uh, graded out of one and they're f um, basically it's multiple choice. So if you, or uh, you say it's graded out of 100, uh, if you guess every answer, on average you're likely to get 20 out of 100. Well, the average score for the students in teachers' colleges in Sweden a few years ago was 25 out of 100. So it's quite likely that some of those teachers' college students had done worse than random guessing on the entrance test. Not necessarily raising the bar um, with that kind of regulation. So that's a real problem. If you use exclusively uh, government dollars for uh, a school choice program like this, uh, you often bring on uh, a proliferation of regulations that may not be helpful. Well, a few years ago, I decided to study whether there are other kinds of school choice programs that would be um, less likely to cause this accruing of regulation. Uh, I looked at tax credit programs which uh, harness private dollars. Um, the main kind of tax credit program is a scholarship donation. What happens is that the taxpayer has the option of donating to uh, a nonprofit charitable organization uh, called a scholarship granting organization, much as you would donate to any other charity. But in return for the donation, you receive back a tax cut, essentially, a tax credit of between 80 and 100 percent of your donation. So it costs you very little um, to make the donation. Then the scholarship organizations disperse these private funds to families who want access to private schools. So this is all private dollars. The, no, no one is forced to participate. If you want to make a donation to a scholarship organization, you can. If you do decide to, you pick which organization receives your money. So you can look for quality, you can look for their educational background. It's, uh, it's a good voluntary system. And arguably, I thought, because it's voluntary, there may be less incentive for regulation. And so there may be less regulation of these programs while still giving all families access to private schooling. So I did a regression study and I found that there is indeed a very large difference between vouchers which are publicly funded and these privately funded tax credits. Uh, the vouchers had a very large and very statistically significant impact raising the regulation that was put on educators. The tax credits did not even have a statistically significant effect. Since then I've run more recent numbers and the effect by tax credits is also statistically significant, but it's very small in magnitude. So it's a real effect, but it doesn't really increase the regulatory burden on educators very much. So this is quite promising. There are, there's a couple of, uh, you know, so these are other choices for you to consider when uh, looking at private school choice programs. The tax credit does seem to be less burdensome on, ed on educators, uh, which is good for allowing the sort of innovation we're trying to create. Um, happy to answer any questions. I'll, I'll just wrap up now and uh, thank you again for uh, your attention.
Well, there have been uh, states that successfully enacted uh, education tax credit programs that could not enact a voucher. Um, years ago, Rhode Island enacted an education tax credit program with a House, Senate, and Governor who are all members of the Democratic Party, uh, which goes to show that resistance can be less from the traditional opponents of uh, private school choice programs. I think uh, the greatest thing to do is, as, I, as someone mentioned earlier in the day during the education panel, I think is to show the people who are the likely beneficiaries of these programs, to, to bring them out before the media, before legislators. Um, there is a scholarship donation tax credit program in Florida. And for a while, it wasn't receiving any, uh, any real opposition from the teachers' union, but then they started to push back a little and lean on legislators. Uh, John Kirtley, who um, was instrumental in getting that program passed, uh, is a fairly wealthy individual. And he thought, you know what would help would be if I could put some constituents in front of legislators who are softening on this program. So he did. He rented school buses or charter buses and brought in people from all over the state to the Capitol and had them go in round robin on a schedule to visit their legislators. And the legislators for a while tried to, you know, very <laughs> hide under their desks and such, but you can only do that for so long because I believe that they also put these people up in hotel rooms for a few nights. So <laughs> it, it was a relentless onslaught. You know, you can't take this program away from my child. He or she is benefiting tremendously was the story these legislators were hearing over and over again. And as a result, the program in Florida has been expanded four or five times and it's increasingly uh, bipartisan in the support it's, it's getting. I think it now has about um, half of the Democratic caucus and three quarters or all of the African American and Hispanic caucuses in the state legislature. And that's very helpful to protect the program. Um, so I think if you get something passed, um, bringing people in, bringing constituents in who are beneficiaries of the program is a, is a great thing to do. Although a little expensive to do the way currently did it. <laughs> yes, ah, just a question back here. Uh, actually, uh, Steven Segaler, the gentleman I'm working with, uh, has made some editorial suggestions that have nothing to do with the, the findings I'm reporting, have purely to do with the storytelling, ordering of segments, that sort of thing. Uh, he's been incredibly helpful and, and not trying to change the message I'm, I'm endeavoring to get across. Uh, so far, it looks like that will remain the case, um, knock on wood. I, I don't anticipate any pushback on the message at this point. To put in front of people um, the answer to that question, why doesn't excellence scale up in education the way it does in other fields? Um, that's, the, that's the question at the heart of the whole series. And so I actually take people to Chile and Sweden, to India, to Korea, and show them entrepreneurs who are working incredibly hard, risking their own money to educate kids at every level of socioeconomic status. I've been in the slums of Hyderabad uh, where uh, you know, the level of destitution is rare, uh, at that level is, is rare to see in the United States anywhere, but uh, really grinding, grinding poverty. And there are entrepreneurs in those areas who have managed to come up with business models that they can serve students, uh, serve families with fee charging private schools, 
without receiving any philanthropy or state funding. And they're working very hard to do it. Uh, but they have a tremendous incentive. Um, there was a report done uh, about public schools in uh, India many years ago, and it found a lot of cases where teachers were not showing up, or if they showed up, they were not actually teaching. There's a lot of problem with uh, bureaucratic meltdown uh, in India, and the private schools can't survive if they don't actually provide instruction. The parents are there, you know, dropping their kids off in the morning. They see whether the teachers have showed up or not. And if they haven't, they just take their business elsewhere. Um, the majority of kids in the poor areas of Hyderabad, for instance, are in private schools. And these schools charge on the order of four or five dollars a month in tuition. Uh, that's in US dollars. So it's it's amazing to, to see these stories um, firsthand, uh, to have Ernesto Tironi tell you and tell the audience that he got into this business to, sor to serve low-income kids. The data shows that he and his colleagues are doing a good job, and the government has just outlawed his form of business organization. Uh, I think that's very helpful. Part of the reason I decided to make a series instead of uh, a one-off, um, like Waiting for Superman or such like, some, some of the other education documentaries, they're all one episode. And I feel you have, to do, uh, you have to do one of two things. If you're a one episode documentary about a complex issue, you have to cram all your facts in incredibly densely, or you can't put in all of the important information that's necessary for the audience to understand the issue. So by making a four episode series, I'm able to introduce evidence at a, at a relatively good pace. I'm not shoving it down <laughs> the viewer's mouth. Uh, and also being able to do it at a, at a leisurely pace makes it less likely, I think, to raise hackles with people who don't like the idea of private education or for-profit education. Uh, indeed, I don't introduce the importance of for-profit education until well into the uh, documentary series. I think it's episode three. <laughs> okay, one more question. Yes. Right. Right. Um, I'm well. Actually, there is a short video um, based on a story, uh, an essay that you'll know uh, called "I Pencil," uh, which is a story of how pencils are made and the incredible number of people involved in the cooperation organization, and all of that happens because of markets, uh, that coordination of activity. Uh, and I recently saw on my Facebook feed that someone is planning to remake eye pencil as eye whiskey, <laughs> which should attract a larger audience, I think, today. <laughs> um, I was going to say something else. Um, oh, yes, the other thing, uh, we have a messaging problem because there is this knee-jerk reflex to entrepreneurship and education. And so my approach was to, well, my, my Hippocratic oath of documentary filmmaking was first, entertain. And if you've entertained the viewers, then you can actually you know, educate them about these important things. And so I take people to all sorts of locations that would appear to have nothing to do with education and then tie them all together. Uh, we visit a winery in Chile. Uh, a brewery uh, out in, outside of Polsbo, a brewery in Bremerton. Um, and all of this is tied into the storyline uh, for what I think is good reason. Uh, and also we tied in, or I tied in uh, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, 
uh, as well as McCloskey's theory of the Industrial Revolution because um, McCloskey points out that in addition to Shakespeare, you can see this change in attitudes toward business people in Austin and Gaskell and a lot of the other great writers of the 19th century. And these are names that will be very familiar to regular PBS viewers since a lot of BBC America or BBC productions have been brought to the US by PBS. Uh, and so I actually have a clip of Pride and Prejudice. Um, we filmed in Manchester, which uh, allowed me to do um, some references to Elizabeth Gaskell and her uh, story North and South, which has been dramatized by the BBC. Uh, there are also some movie references. I have a Casablanca reference and a reference to It Happened One Night, which swept the Oscars in 1934. If you haven't seen it, highly recommend it. <laughs> Uh, I think that's all we have time for, so thank you again very much.